during the past few years that when we talk about the legacies of transatlantic slavery, how many people in the United Reformed Church and beyond are suddenly unable to see or understand the word legacy? How many people raise the argument that transatlantic slavery was terrible, but it's in the past and we need to get over it? Move on. But that is exactly the point. Transatlantic slavery established black people as the little toe of the body if that much. And centuries later, black people are still constantly relegated to the position of the little toe. That bit that doesn't really matter. That bit to which we often don't give a second thought. But when I shared this reflection with my daughter, apparently she's wiser than I am. Because she said, you know what, mommy? She Googled. Google is a lot wiser than I am. <laughs> and she said, the body needs the little toe for balance. And the body, it needs the little toe for propulsion, for it to move forward. The body needs the little toe, it's important. But we don't realize that unless or until the little toe is damaged or removed. The little toe is for the benefit of the whole body. If we're talking music, and how can I not talk music today, and with a choreographer in our midst, how can I not talk music? How is the body going to dance? How is it going to find our full and free rhythm without the little toe to keep us upright and to keep us balanced? We need that little toe. But so often, it's out of sight and out of mind. And you know, I'm not actually saying that it's always the case that the little toe is being deliberately harmed, deliberately stamped on, although there are some big bad bullies who will do that. But I would contend that overt personal racism is not the main issue for our context, and not the main issue when engaging with the legacy of transatlantic slavery. More often it's the case that while the other parts of the body which are deemed to be most valuable or most beautiful or most precious are given particular efforts and care to keep them that way, the little toe may be harmed by being simply overlooked. We may be so busy trying to make the whole foot look stylish, trying to create or maintain an overall image that the little toe ends up crammed into a space in which it is not okay a space in which it cannot breathe, a space in which it suffers damage because it is rendered unable to simply be. I have a quick question, and you have to tell the truth. It's confession time. How many of us in this room, in this church, have owned or do own a pair of shoes that in real life, you know it kind of squeezes your toe? You know, you know it's not comfortable. You know it's not comfortable. And if you keep it on too long, oh, but for now, you put it on and you look in the mirror and you say, but look, it goes with my outfit. It goes with my gentleman, you're not exempt. It goes with my suit. <laughs> so you bear the pain for now in order to look good. <laughs> so the little toe is being home because it's being overlooked. Because while the hole looks good, the little toe isn't feeling good. And it occurred to me, it occurred to me that that is a lot like how structural racism works. We don't see it, we don't think about it until and unless something causes us to do so. We get used to the way things are, even when it's not in our favor. It may not occur to us to challenge or resist or try to change it because it just is the way that it is. The little toe is of little consequence until it causes the body pain. And now I'm bringing this into the realities of life. Consider the outrage in some corners when people dared to assert that black lives matter. How dare they? Black lives matter? Suddenly there were cries, well, don't all lives matter? Isn't it racist to say that black lives matter? What about everyone else? But I have a question. Why was there apparently no drive to make the assertion about all lives mattering until voices 
started to speak up and speak out for the black lives around the globe, which have been treated as dispensable for numerous decades and centuries, treated as having less worth. How do people not see that it is meaningless to say that all lives matter unless and until black lives are treated as if they matter? Because the truth is, the truth is, everybody, I guarantee, I, gu I, I, I have zero doubt that everybody in this room, in this church today, everybody knows that white lives matter. So we don't need to say it. But everybody in this room will know the next bit, but not everybody around know to the same extent that black lives matter. And that's why we need to say black lives matter. All lives don't matter until black lives matter. The Bible text says, those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. I want to ask, in the context of racial justice, isn't it time we started living that out? When are we going to give greater honor to those who have been cast as less deserving? Less deserving of respect, less deserving of honor. If not now, then when? And so why then was the proposal of an apology for the past and for the present wrongs related to, tra relating to transatlantic slavery so objectionable to some parts of the United Reformed Church body? I'm a member of the United Reformed Church, but I'm going to be honest with you about the picture in the United Reformed Church. I'm not saying it's a racist church, but I'm saying that there is a lack of understanding and there is a resistance to some of the things which are just truth. I want to pose another question. Who has the right to decide which part in the body is played by who? Who has that right? Who decides that this person is an eye and that person is the nose and the other person is the heart? Is it God who apportions the status? Or do we apportion the status to each other? Do we even presume to apportion the status to ourselves? And I don't want anyone to get me wrong. Because I'm going to say again, every part in the body is valuable. And there is nothing wrong with the little toe being a little toe. But here is the question. Could it be that we ask members who could and should be carrying out a central function, a visible function, to be satisfied with the role of being baby pinky? Where are the body's ears when God is calling some of those members to something more or something else? And could it be that some of those members who are entrusted to function as major organs are in fact gifted with attributes of an appendix? And as far as I understand it, I'm not medically trained like our minister's good wife, but as far as I understand it, the appendix doesn't really serve any useful purpose anymore, apart from to grumble every so often and make people sick. <laughs> Who presumes the right to decide? These are some of the questions we pose to the URC over the past few years as we engage with the legacies of slavery. And let me tell you, it has not been an easy journey, but it has been, and it is, a necessary journey. The URC is 52 years old. In our 52-year history, the General Secretariat, those in the sort of senior leadership in the church, has always consisted entirely of white people. There are 13 regional moderators at any given time, but there's only ever been one of moderator from an ethnic minority background. And I remember meeting with a synod moderator, and one of those colleagues pondered, looked around and pondered, and said, but how do we know that the people in this room, this all white gathering, how do we know that these don't just happen to be the people that God has called to serve in this way? And I will tell you today, what I told that individual then, and what I told the whole group then. While I absolutely affirm that it is God who calls, 
It is human beings and human processes which appoint. It is human processes which create the systems which keep re recreating themselves. So that a space predominantly shaped and occupied by white, middle-class, middle-aged men will produce other spaces predominantly occupied by white, middle-class, and middle-aged men. God put all in the body according to God's will. And I do not, I absolutely do not for a second believe that God chooses for black people to be continually absent from positions of leadership and decision making and influence in our church, in our nations, or in our world. And it simply cannot be that it's God's will that some people are perpetually blessed and highly favored, while others are perpetually cast down, cast out, overlooked, and ignored. When you think about the global dynamics, who are the people who are perpetually up here? And who are the people who are perpetually cast down? Could that really be God's will? And I want to say absolutely not. And if it's not God's will, then it's a situation which needs to be challenged and changed. And hence the current work within the URC, seeking to move the church from a position of being not racist to becoming an actively anti-racist church, seeking to address the glaring imbalance, seeking to address the glaring injustice, and we're starting within our own body. We are called to be one body. We claim to be one body. But do we really mean it? And why then does naming the issues referring to legacies of transatlantic slavery cause some of us to burn with anger, to declare that these issues are a non-issue, even prompt some people to threaten to leave the church if we pursue this work? And that has happened. What happened to being part of a body in which if one part hurts, all parts hurt? If I explain that parts of our body are hurting and have been hurting for a long time, while it may be difficult to hear, how can that pain be deemed a non-issue by other members of the same body? How can the response be to turn away or threaten to leave the body in which we've heard that we are all inextricably linked? I've listened in the past few days to Reverend Colin Cowan talking about reparation as something which starts by focusing on relationships restoring relationships which have been broken and disfigured by the evil of transatlantic slavery and the continuing structures of racism and injustice. I heard somebody make re reference earlier on today about loving your neighbor as you love yourself because if we start with a relationship, I can't in all conscience look at my neighbor still suffering the consequences of these legacies and leave it that way. So the other reparations will follow if we start with the relationship. We need to listen and hear and feel and feel the pain and journey so that the healing can follow, so that new life can flow. In July 2022, after much work by the Legacy of Slavery Task Group, the URC General Assembly adopted a statement of confession and apology regarding the legacies of transatlantic slavery. And I want to say that I was delighted. I want to say that, but I can't. Because delight is not the emotion that I felt. What I felt was relief. Because as I heard confirmation that the resolution had been adopted, I had the sensation of being able to breathe. It was as if I had been holding my breath without realizing it and I don't know for how long, mm -hmm. because the journey was painful, and we had to listen and engage. We had to listen and engage with some things that, you know, for now, I think the best I can say is foolishness, foolishness. But we had to read and engage and take seriously. And it hurt, it hurt, but we needed to do it. And so I felt as if I'd been holding my breath. And that positive response to our work felt like affirmation that the URC is, after all, a body in which I can have belonging, a body of which I can be a part. 
I think I'd started to doubt. Alongside the July 2022 um, apology, confession and apology, there came a commitment to acts of repair and justice, or reparation. Those of us who were tasked with forwarding the URC's work had insisted that that commitment to practical action must be made at the same time as the apology, otherwise the apology was meaningless. Damage has been done. Damage is still being done and we need to be part of the journey of putting right. The URC commitment to repairing justice is taking three distinctive strands. Local, within our own body, because we can't look out into the world and presume to be putting right unless we're putting ourselves right. So that's where, where, where we're starting. We're looking regional within the UK, and particularly looking at addressing mentoring for young black men who persistently find themselves foul of the system, the criminal justice system, the education system. And we know it's not just because they're not good, it's because of the continuing legacy, and we need to do something about it. And we're also looking global, because we know that our sisters and brothers in the Caribbean and in Africa are also a part of this body to which we also belong. And it's that third strand that brings our delegation here today, working with craft as Tessa said to you earlier on, to hear from Jamaica what it is that is needed in Jamaica. The UK and Britain was part of bringing about all the wrongs that exist. We are not presuming to come along and say, now we know what is needed to put right. That's why we need to listen, and that's why we need to come. You were greeted today by our moderator, Reverend Dr. Tessa Henry Robinson. And I use Tessa's full title very, very deliberately whenever I introduce her anyway. Because here is a beautiful and gifted black woman who has studied and earned her credentials. And so it was a true delight when in July 2023, Tessa was inducted as moderator of URC General Assembly. First black woman to serve in that role, and only the second black person to do so. And she embodies the right to serve in that position. And I say that because sometimes we almost get treated as if, if black people are making it somewhere, it's like somebody did us a favor. They gave us a little bring to let us in. But it's no bring -in. We are meant to be there. We have the right to be there. We have the qualifications to be there. We have the skills to be there. We have the calling to be there. We are meant to be there. And Tessa is now there in the URC. Earlier on in 2023, we also saw a young woman of Ghanaian heritage called Philippa Osse become the first black moderator of URC Youth Assembly. It's wonderful, but remember we're 52 years old and these are still first. It's wonderful, change is happening. It is long overdue, it is slow, but it is starting. And for that I rejoice. And I'm going to say, don't let me start the chorus, but there is indeed reason to sing and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But we need to keep, we also need to keep singing the songs of lament until these first are no longer first. No longer first. We are different members, but we are one body. I am me and you are you, exactly as God intended. But God also intended that all parts should be honored, all parts cared for, all parts cared about. There should be no difference in life chances or quality of life based on the color of a person's skin, or the land in which they were born, or the accent with which they speak, or anything else. No longer Jew nor Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer male and female, because all are one. I believe with my whole heart that that, is, that image is God's intention for the whole of humanity. But I say this, surely, 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 
It should start with the church. Amen. I'm just going to leave you with one final poem that speaks. It speaks. You'll hear. It's called One. I am one woman, singing with one voice. I have only one opinion, mine, in that I have no choice. I can take what I believe, express it with a shout, but the whisper of the masses will always drown my one voice out. I am part of one family with different pitch and tone. I have my view and you have yours, but we don't have to stand alone. I can take what I believe and share my thoughts with you. By listening and by learning, we can write our songs anew. We are part of one people, a thousand thousand voices ring, each one to a unique tune, but seeking the same thing. To take that thing each one believes and tell and make it known to gain respect and understanding for the song that is our own. We are one humanity, a million million hearts now long, to express the thing that each holds dear, to sing aloud their song, to take the thing which they believe and with an aim preferred, shout it loud from deep within and make their voices heard. One creation, all of us, myriad, myriad in our throng, and what a noise we all could make is singing the same song. A song of joy, a song of peace, a song in which we find relief, a mighty song to set us free, a song for you, a song for me. I am just one woman, singing with one voice. I have only one opinion, mine, but I have a choice, to find the thing that we believe, stand with you in one shout, invite the world to join our song, and we will never be drowned out. Okay, may I invite us to change our position as we sing the choral response, we want to see Jesus lifted high.
to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see. We want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Please be seated. And let us pray. Loving, wonderful, merciful, majestical, brilliant, unspeakable God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for all that you are, for all you have been, for all you will be, the fact that you are eternal. From the beginning of time to the end of time, beyond the realms of time, beyond the realms of understanding. It is our privilege to be in your presence. And it is our privilege to know that you are our parent God. It is our privilege to know that we are loved and beloved by you. We thank you and praise you that you are a God of extravagance where the world teaches us about scarcity. The world says there is not enough to go around. The world says, I don't have enough to give you some. But you, you sent Jesus, who came to bring life and life in all abundance, life in all its fullness for all people. But in this moment, we recognize that that is an aspiration. That is what it should be. But we are falling short. And we pray, we pray, for those who are bearing the brunt of our shortcomings. We pray for those who don't have enough physically. We pray for those who don't have enough in terms of food and shelter, in terms of finances, in terms of homes, in terms of safety, in terms of medical care. We pray for those who are living in situations of war and terror and abuse. We pray for those who are crying out, but their voices are going unheard, or their voices are being deliberately silenced. We pray for the members of your church, your global church, those who wish to and do proclaim your word and praise you. And we pray for those who are restricted and who are told that they cannot. Loving God, we pray your peace and your blessing upon all of your people, not just the ones that we know, not just the ones that we can name, not just the ones that we care about. Because, dear Lord, we are so grateful that you see the whole body. We see only parts, but you see the whole body. And you care about every member. And so we commit every member to you and ask you, Lord, to have your way. Have your way. In Jesus' name, have your way. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Again, we want to thank all our visitors who shared in our worship experience with us today. We really appreciate your time and your input. And please do come again. Thank you. Please listen to our fellowship news. This month is Youth Month. Synodical Youth Sunday will be on April 28th. Our Bible study continues this Thursday, April 18, at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary, thank you. Board of Elders meeting will be held this Saturday, April 20, at 5 p.m., also here in our conference room. 
And Reverend Keen would like to meet briefly after this morning's service with Elder Conroy Merchant and all members of and adherents of the Independence City, Cumberland, West Cumberland, Cedar Grove, Cedar Manor, Meadowvale, Christian Penn, Christian Meadows, and Caymanas Gardens District. We are reminded of the special offering mentioned on Palm Sunday towards purchase of our monitor. This offering will be taken next Sunday. Convocation 2024, celebrate in red. Let's wear red as a mark of celebration as we gather for the UCJCI Convention 2024 at the Montego Bay Convention Center on Sunday, May 5, 8.30 to 3 p.m. Our preacher will be Reverend Glenroy Clark, Minister of the Lucy Charge of United Churches. Please don't miss this grand celebration. Let us praise God together and listen to God's word for our church. Please note our church will be closed on that date. Those who will be traveling by the JUTC premium bus and have not yet indicated, please sign the registration form. It will be in the Gordon Evans Hall. The bus fare is 3,500 and the bus will leave our church at 5 a.m. sharp. For persons celebrating birthday this week and also a wedding anniversary, we would like to further celebrate with you. So if you're here, please uh, could you stand so we can identify with you. On the fourth, Edith Lawrence, Gordon Swaby. On the 16th, Ansel Collins. On the 19th, Rosetta Williams, Emile Douglas. On the 20th, Lauren Bunzi, Christine Hines, Arlene Supersad, Kalitha Samuels. Sister Bunzi, and us sing our birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. God's riches. Birthday when it comes. Uh, Twinny, I'm not seeing your sister today. Say happy birthday. Thank you. She's a twin, uh, people. I had to say that. Okay, wedding anniversary on the 14th, Gordon and Andrew Swaby. And they are here. Let's bind them together. <laughs> bind them, us together. <laughs> Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. Wonderful, wonderful day when it comes. Thank you. 
Okay. Please remember to pray and call, visit with our sick and housebound members. They're listed on your bulletin, but I'll just quickly go through. Olive Bulai, Ivy Lee, Patrona Edwards Gordon, Michelle Duval, Gwendolyn Turnbull, Marilyn Reed, Adassa Foster, Edith Lawrence, Dorothy Whitaker, Gloria Darby, Patrika Morgan, and Lena Edwards. Please, Lena Edwards, pray for them as well. Our deepest condolence goes to our drummer, Glenn, Glenn Don. I don't think he's here today. On the death of his father, please pray for Glenn Don and the rest of his family. The Bridgeport District Meeting will be held at 5 p.m. PM today in the Ministry Center. Use of our facilities, the Sanctuary and Gordon Evans Hall will be in use this Saturday, April 20, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for funeral service and repast. These are our fellowship news. Thank you so much for listening and have a blessed day. Thank you. Okay, may I invite the birthday and anniversary celebrants to come as we... <laughs> For you, I am praying, I pray it's for you, for you, I am praying for you, I am praying for you, I am praying. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for this beautiful day, the day in which you have made. And as your people, we have gathered together this morning, rejoicing and being glad and celebrating, Lord, with our brother and sisters as they celebrate their birthday and wedding anniversary. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of life and for all the blessings, Lord, that you provide, you, that life brings, and all the opportunity, O oh Lord. You said in your word that you came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. And what other blessing, Lord, what blessing this morning that is more important than the gift of life? And so, God, we celebrate another year, a year of good health, of prosperity, of spiritual growth and development, and just, Lord, being able to be a part of this faith community. We thank you, Lord, in a very special way for Gordon and Andrea as they celebrate another year of marriage. Oh, God, we cover them this morning under the shadow of your almighty wings. We pray that you will anoint them afresh from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, that their love will be uh, strengthened this morning, that the love they share, Lord, will, will grow from strength to strength each day. And Lord, even as they continue to serve you, that the beauty of Jesus will be seen in them and their relationship. We thank you, Almighty God, for all that they continue to do uh, for, for you, Lord. We thank you for their family, Lord, May you bless them abundantly. May you cover them, Lord, under the shadow of your almighty wings. And we pray, God, that their marriage will, Lord, radiate your love so that others will see them, Lord, as an example. 
We thank you for them this morning. We thank you for our sisters celebrating their birthday this morning. Lord, strengthen them. Lord, we pray that you will grant them good health so that next year this time, Lord, we will celebrate with them once more. We pray, God, that they will know that your grace is sufficient for them this morning. We thank you, almighty God, for what you have done for them and for what you continue to do, O oh God. Surround them with your love. Comfort them. Grant them, O oh God, the desires of their hearts this morning. And so, Lord, we pray. And we continue to lift them up throughout this week as they celebrate anniversary and birthday, remembering that everything comes from you, everything begins with you, and that everything ends with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Bless you. Bless you. And as we close this worship experience, a one with a difference, thanks to Dr. Karen. That's been a difference. And we really appreciate your coming and sharing with us. Let us stand and sing the closing hymn, Lord of the Dance. danced in the morning when the world was young. I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth. In Bethlehem I had my birth. Dance, dance wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I lead receive the benediction we have entered and we have worshipped may we now depart to serve 
and the blessings of God the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with all of you, your loved ones near and far, this day and always. Amen. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I will bless you in the name of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I will bless you in the name of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I will bless you in the name. Name of the Lord, the blessing of 